Hello, Zach, can you hear me? Yep. Excellent, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna try to start my audio, but uh, my computer has been crashing on occasionally when I do, so I'll, I'll be back if it happens. Okay. Hello. Zach, you're on. Hi. Martin, you're muted, but now you're not. Yep, hello. Hi. Hi, Zach. There. Sorry, I was typing. That's why I was muted. Yeah, and Brad is on. Hello. Okay. There's four of us. <laughs> <laughs> to start. I'm on my other computer too, looking at all the information that Amy sent me on Colvin. It's actually not there, but here.
you know, the most interesting, Brad, um, of all the documents that were sent, that you had uh, sent to Amy and you had looked up, the most telling one is the one, uh, the sc screenshot she sent me of the um, proposed school property where it shows the impacted area of where there was some contamination and then another area where there was very little and there uh, was a soil test and very little contamination and there's a little teensy bit that hangs over the very western edge of the property did they did they test the entirety of the property in that report though i have to go back and look at it um they they tested the, the, there was a geotechnical report that showed that um, most of it was fill and junk, and there was a, a report regarding the um, the elementary school that uh, the charter school wanted to build that showed that there was some contamination, but it wasn't significant. But I mean, this, this shows, you know, as far as where the public school was supposed to go, that there wasn't any contamination on the current site because the school's to be built to the west of the current site. Al, I don't remember. Did, was the document, do you have the document up? Was it a phase one? Because if it was a phase one, it should encompass the entire property. There, there's a there's a phase one somewhere. Uh, I saw it referenced. I think it might have been in yeah. a comprehensive yeah, I thought plan, it was, but I don't know that I've seen back back when. I don't know that we have it. I don't know if we have that one. We have like five or six different ones, but I don't know if we have that. Could have sworn I've seen it in the past, but well, the, the one I'm referring Where? to is the is just the the screenshot uh, map uh, of the proposed middle school at the time and in the middle of that property that they uh, were going to build on is it doesn't come close you know it's it's at the beginning of it is at the very western edge of the property that they want to build a 60 colon on and there was a contamination on the site And that's only showing about a third of 60 Colvin, though, on that map. Yeah, but that entire, the, the point is that that's a, uh, that particular uh, item is not even, uh, that map shows that the middle school had nothing to do with that, with the site where 60 Colvin wants to be. And, and that the, the pollution was found on the site that the middle school w wanted to be built. The, 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 the sites referenced in the comp plan are 60 Colvin and 60 B Colvin. What's showing on this map is 60 B Colvin and about a third, the rear third of 60 Colvin at the bottom of the screen. Well, we have everybody um, but Glenisa right now. Are you guys able to see the PDF on the screen too? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so this is from the, the um, DC um, application and this shows the um, soil testing locations. Um, so the soil testing locations were solely on the property behind 60 Colvin Avenue. Um, and so the, the yellow here is where they approximate the fill material to be located. Um, what, what are you showing there? I'm, I'm not with you. I, I don't have, all I have is Brad looking at me or looking at something. <laughs> That's okay. 
Um, so this is from a CHA report, um, and I think this is um, what the city had used um, when they were initially um, thinking about applying for brownfield funding um, in the past. Um, so this is just a map showing where um, CHA did um, soil testing, and the soil testing was solely on um, the property behind 60 Colvin Avenue. Yeah, well, um, that was that's the map that I was referring to. Yeah, yeah, that's. I, mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure that we were looking at the same thing. Yeah. Yep. But I think we uh, probably it's after six, so we should get the the meeting underway. Um, let me just see if we have. Okay, we don't have Glenisa. I think she said she might not be able to make it tonight, so. Okay. All righty, so we'll start the meeting. Uh, for those folks who are um, not on the board and in attendance, um, welcome and th thanks for being here. And thanks for spending time, I guess, indoors when we had one really beautiful day before it uh, turns hot and humid again. Um, this is a workshop meeting of the uh, Albany City Planning Board. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is for the planning staff to present projects uh, that we've seen in the past, but may have changed or may have moved to uh, a different uh, solutions. Uh, and for us to look at potential new projects in concept form. Uh, so this is a, basically a conversation uh, between planning staff and planning board members. Uh, we, the um, public uh, will not be able to speak, but certainly can listen in and you would have an opportunity to address the planning board on any of these projects at our July meeting, which is going to be on July 28th, also by Zoom. In some cases, the planning board members may ask um, applicants who might be um, listening in um, a question or two to clarify an item. Um, but um, in most cases, the, the conversations among the planning board members and the staff so with that, I would like to begin. And our first uh, item on our agenda is the project known as 76, which is um, at 76 Second Avenue. And this, of course, the board has seen before at our previous meeting. And uh, this would require a, a zoning amendment change uh, for a fairly complex uh, multi-use project excuse me, in the south end. So Zach or Brad, do you want to update us on that? Yeah. Um, so just from the last meeting, um, actually on the day of the last <laughs> meeting, um, the applicant had submitted some new materials to Matt, us. Before we get going, I want to address yeah. you. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, Al, in lieu of our trainings, uh, recent trainings and conversations that I have with Corporation Council, I just wanted to identify that uh, I have um, served on boards with members of people working on 76, in particular, Jockey and Hoke, and that we are not related parties, not family, and I have no financial interest in this project, uh, only as a concerned member of the South End and a member of the board. That's it, Zach. Perfect, Chris, thanks for interrupting me with that. Um, and yes, so, thank you, Chris. Yeah, and again, to all board members, if you have an instance where you think you might have a conflict of interest or you feel like you need to specify your relationship in relationship to a, an applicant or a certain project, feel free to jump in um, when we start discussing. Um, Just to okay. clarify, um, I, I don't think there's any conflict of interest here, but I did advise Chris, that if you wanted to, you know, just give full disclosure, just to state that, but I don't believe that there's any conflict of interest. Great. 
Thanks for the, the clarification. Um, so on the day of our last meeting, we received additional materials from the applicant um, related to the zoning map amendment, as well as some of the subsequent applications that they're looking to submit. Um, so some of those items included a traffic report and uh, transportation demand management plan, a geotechnical report, a survey for the entire site, a shadow study, and then um, updated project narratives. Um, so looking through this, um, there are some things that jump out to us as staff. Um, and just to let the board know, we haven't sent these notes out to the applicant, but we are gonna do that this week. Um, there are some things that um, can be easily addressed um, prior to the planning board making a recommendation. Um, and there's some larger things that uh, the planning board, uh, I think, has the ability either to make a recommendation or wait for more information um, before sending to the Common Council. Um, but looking at those materials, um, just kind of reiterating that the um, applicant doesn't have site control over all of the properties that they're including in the application. Um, so while they, they don't need control for the zoning map amendment, um, the way that this project is being reviewed under Seeker is based on what the applicant is proposing to build. Um, so currently they haven't included any design alternatives in the event that they will not be able to acquire those properties. So um, that may uh, create some difficulties down the line or may require additional Seeker review um, to assess the impact of the project if it does change going forward. Um, second point, um, the applicant um, had included a traffic report with the projected um, changes in level of service. Um, uh, although they mentioned this um, in a chart, they don't uh, really address any ways that they'll be mitigating um, the degradation of um, the projected level of service on the northbound approach at 2nd Avenue and Leonard Street, um, which is going from a level of service of C to D. Uh, third point, um, some of the uh, documents have conflicting references to the height of the building, um, which is a relatively easy thing to correct. Um, and currently the parking requirement calculations are incorrect. Um, they're not too far off, but it's just something that should be um, fixed um, so that the um, planning board and the common council are making sure that they're reviewing as accurate of documents as possible. So they're making as accurate um, of decisions as possible. Um, and then finally, the applicant for the um, parking calculations um, factored in that there would be a route uh, within a quarter of a mile that has a peak frequency of 15 minutes or better. Um, that currently doesn't exist right now, but CDTA is looking to start running a bus plus blue line um, which will likely have a peak service um, frequency of 15 minutes or better, but that just should be confirmed for the record going forward. Um, so those are the some of the things um, that we've noted. Um, I think as the application continues to be reviewed um, through district plan review and development plan review, demolition review, conditional use permit review, um, some of these items will come up again, um, and that will give the planning board a full opportunity to look at them um, in depth as well. Uh, but just uh, these are the things that kind of jumped out uh, when reviewing the new application materials um, and just might be a consideration uh, for the planning board making a recommendation on the zoning map amendment. Zach, can you expand on the, the second bullet or show it on the survey? Uh, show what on the survey? The, uh, the degradation in the uh, project level of service. Yeah, let me, um, let me see if I can just pull that up. Bear with me while I do that. Zach, is that a, is that a project specific comment or is that, did that look at, analyses beyond the current 
proposal or the what we expect to be the proposal that's submitted subsequent to the zone change well for, for for the for the current i'm just kind of i just didn't understand was this just because that one street would be converted to uh what like a walkway right around and, and cut off or no so the the street that's going to be converted to a walkway is called scott street um so they're um reviewing this application under the assumption that that is um that the city sells that to the applicant um, and that that does turn into a walkway. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm just trying to understand the what's meant by the uh, degradation in the level of service. Um, so it's just, so currently right now it's at a level um, uh, C in the PM uh, hours uh, during uh, peak traffic. Um, what they're projecting in 2021 is that'll be a D level of service. Um, so A is um, the least amount of traffic and then that goes down all the way to F, which is standstill. I did right, but D is not that unusual for an urban, you know, a built up urban place for an intersection on a busy street. Yeah, it, the only reason I bring that up is just because of Second Avenue being fairly narrow um and you know not the the best um visual clearance for drivers pedestrians because cyclists. Of that. there's a little curve in the street there right right so yeah. again these are not um huge things or things that can't be addressed by the applicant i think these are just things you know i wanted to make the planning board aware of and just identify um, when thinking about a recommendation for uh, the zoning map amendment So I did just want to underscore the what the board is considering is the recommendation on the zoning amendment to the common council. Um, what inevitably may be the project we we all expect and know for pretty sure that it's going to be this project. But depending upon whatever that initial that that inevitable project is, there will be an opportunity through the context of that project to evaluate traffic impacts based upon the particulars of that project. So. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, if you're increasing the intensity of the allowing, allowed uses, um, it's probably more likely when we do get that traffic report or we do review that project, um, that there's more likely to be an impact on service. But until we know specifically what the project is and until that specific project is in front of us, um, you know, we're not going to know exactly what the impact is, but it's not our last opportunity to delve into that as well. I wanted to go to the first item that you mentioned, Zach, uh, which is the site control. Um, you said that uh, they didn't present uh, an alternative, but um, I do remember at the, at the first workshop and then also at the planning board meeting, I believe that they, they presented um, a plan that showed if they had complete site control and then also a plan in case they didn't have site control, at least I think of the properties on Second Avenue, but um, are, are they not, um, are they just moving uh, forward with the, the one major one as if they have site control over everything and not showing any alternatives? That's my understanding. And really this is speaking more to um, the seeker review process um, and just how they're analyzing the potential impacts. Um, the, the impacts are based on what's being proposed, um, which includes uh, the two properties that they don't have site control over. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, and there's likely to be design changes as the project progresses. Um, it's just since the seeker is being do, done um, prior to the district plan review, the development plan review, demolition review, um, we're just trying to make sure that these things um, are addressed, um, you know, as the project progresses, it might be something, um, and it'll likely be something that comes up again as the planning board reviews those subsequent applications. Yeah, I mean, a project this complex as this way may not be looking like it does right now. There right. definitely may be changes, but, um, I think it's important that uh, you know we go forward with what they have because uh, of the time constraints. 
So we'll so be making that decision or that recommendation at the July meeting. Um, uh, in my opinion, I think the board is in a position to do that. Um, and I think it could be something that's done um, with advisory notes. Um, you know, if board members don't feel comfortable doing that, um, you know, that's up to the board as well. But I think, um, in my opinion, these are not, um, these are not substantial enough issues that um, really should prevent the planning board from making a recommendation. Cause I think any of the no, hacks um, that are listed um, can be addressed in a future um, uh, part of site plan review, development plan review, district plan review. Okay. What happens if, um, you know, the uh, zoning, um, uh, the uh, land use changes are, are, are made but the project doesn't go forward or doesn't go forward in, in its current uh, uh, configuration. Um, does the uh, does the change in, in in the in the land use state is that permanent or does that does it revert back to what it is now? No, that that would be permanent. So um, if the the applicant decides uh, not to pursue constructing on the site, um, it might be something where. Um, our department or the common council may look into um, modifying the zoning again, um, or potentially looking at um, future uses that might work well with mixed use campus mm -hmm. institutional. Um, I think regardless, it'll, um, you know, if, if it, uh, the project does not proceed, um, I think any future changes in the zoning or any future projects will again have um, similar levels of review of what we're seeing right now. So traffic studies or reports, <clears throat> shadow studies, geotechnical report. So, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alrighty. So this would be um, on the July meeting, we will probably move forward with a, a recommendation concerning the zoning. Is that correct? Yep, it's Sorry. it's on the public hearing agenda. Okay. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. No. Um, the next item is a smaller project, and that's 62 Dana Avenue, where there is a request uh, for a conversion of a two-family townhouse into a three-family one, and this is um, conditional use. Yep. Uh, so this is on the kind of opposite end of uh, intensity and scale. Um, uh, so this uh, proposed conversion is in Park South neighborhood. It's located in an RT zoning district and is surrounded by RT properties. Um, the applicant's looking to um, convert the basement um, into a unit. And this is the proposed floor plan for the unit. Where are the utilities remind, at? Remind us why this is a conditional use and we have to review this and if this isn't a, could be a review by the staff. Um, so this is something that's part of our um, residential townhouse zoning district standards. Um, so any conversion of a one family or a two family townhouse dwelling into um, either by adding one or two units, depending on the townhouse, um, requires a conditional use permit. Um, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, these have pretty specific standards. Um, so, you know, if the applicant meets those standards, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty good justification for the planning board in making a decision of whether, yes, they meet the requirements or no, they don't meet the requirements. Um, so since it's a conditional use permit, um, it does require a public hearing. Um, so it would not be eligible for um, a consent agenda item. Um, and then I think Brad, you had a question just about utilities. I was just asking where the utilities, I don't know if that, that room in the front or trash or anything like that, if those were something that we had an indication where those were gonna be addressed. I mean, I. 
to speak to Al's question, I think one of the, the issues is we do have buildings with uh, basement units where there's nowhere to put the trash so that ends up you know out on the sidewalk or places like that right um there's I, I also a concern which i don't know that it um is an issue with this property per se but there was a concern of existing uh single family or properties con conducive to home ownership being converted to add additional units um i mean that a little bit less of a concern maybe where you have what was a two unit rental and changing it to a three unit rental but Again, I think that was the impetus for including some of these provisions. So Sorry, looking at the floor plan, it looks kind of like the central area is where um, the boiler is. Um, so that could be a potential location for someone to store trash um, when it's uh, we not ask trash the applicant day. to speak to it. I think he's on the call. Um, let me look. Who's the applicant here? Um, uh, it's Ron Stein. I believe uh, Pete Tryon is his agent, so he may be able to speak as well. Yeah, he's on the call. Um, Pete, you have well, the opportunity to speak if you'd like. I've, I've given you the ability to talk. OK, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Great. Uh, yeah, for utilities, it'd be that that um, center room. Right now, they have it set up where that's the hot water tank in the back there and the front additional storage. I think the plan called for uh, mini split units. Those are the wall-mounted force hot air and central air units. So there wouldn't be a boiler or uh, HVAC system anywhere in that unit. Okay, so that's, there's, that's uh, consistent with the building code allowances then since there's not a, not a boiler internal to the unit? Yep. Okay. And then what about, uh, where would the trash storage be? Uh, trash we could put in the front of that area uh, where the hot water tank is in the center, or we could build out something smaller uh, in the kitchen area. Maybe you probably want to, yeah, maybe think about that and get back to us. Um, sure. And then I think in Zach, Zach and I in reviewing this application, <laughs> there's some interesting um, provisions with respect to how we measure whether that third unit is, is allowed in the, in the standards. There's, you need to have three stories um, to allow for the conversion to three units. Now a story is defined as a, as a building floor that's not more than four feet uh, below grade which I believe they have provided measurements that shows that this does not go more than four feet below grade. However, uh, our provisions also state that it has to be 50% above grade in the front of the unit, I believe. So there's a little bit of a contradiction there. I know that there were a lot of players when we were putting together these provisions. So that may have been the, the source of that. Um, but I don't know if we've concluded that this may require um, Board of Zoning Appeals action as well. I'm not, I think we're still looking into that. So the, the applicant submitted photos this <laughs> afternoon. I haven't had a time to look at them yet. Um, so I'll, I'll let the board know when it gets closer. Um, yeah, we, we sent that in. There's um, photos documenting it's 50% above. So you'll see that. Yeah. Um, so uh, just for the board members, um, kind of going through the conversion standards, um, as Brad just mentioned, the building has to have at least three stories, which it meets that. Um, no exterior changes to the structural structure can be visible from a public right of way. That's been satisfied. Um, new and existing units either have a minimum size of at least 1,000 square feet or each occupy at least 80% of a single floor plate. It meets the latter of those requirements. It's just shy of a thousand square feet per floor. Um, and then the last one is uh, uh, what uh, Peter and uh, Brad were just speaking to about the low story must be more than 50% above grade. What's the significance of Clinton Avenue when it comes to, to that? 
So there are a lot of um, properties on Clinton Avenue that don't meet this requirement. Um, and so since it was a opportunity on Clinton Avenue to provide um, more housing units, um, when there's a large amount of housing stock that didn't meet that requirement, that's why there was an exception um, granted for properties along Clinton Avenue. Okay. When you say that the lowest story must be more than 50% above grade, does that, and maybe you mentioned this, um, does it matter if it's the front or the rear? Because I think I heard you say something about if it slopes down, you can, the 50% of upgrade could be the rear. Um, so we'd just be measuring from the front. It's really just measuring from the floor to the ceiling of the unit and then um, measuring outside, you know, from grade uh, to the top of the story and then just ensuring that it's more than 50% above that, so. So it has to be the front of the unit. That's what we'd be measuring, yeah. Okay. Any Actually, other questions from the board on this one? No, no two buildings are alike in some of these neighborhoods. Actually, it's not an unfortunately, that's it's kind of one of the positive aspects, but when you're trying to write zoning, it becomes a little bit complicated. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, I just want to mention this will be uh, fixed up in the same manner as uh, Ron's other project there, 85 and 86 Dana, the reserves on in Park South. Okay, uh, let's move on then to the next project with which is the proposed development of Clinton Avenue and Orange Street. Um, and once again, I will have to recuse myself from the conversation because I have a small investment with the Capital District Community Loan Fund, which is part of the developer in this project. So somebody can call me on my telephone, my cell phone when you're done. I can do that, Al. We'll see you in a little while. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, so should we just uh, dive in here? We've seen this one already a couple of times, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, unfortunately for Al, this is a very quick update. Um, so this, <laughs> um, and for all the agenda items um, in the public meeting section, these are really just quick updates. Um, some of these projects are gonna be on the agenda, some of them are not. Um, okay. Just um, kind of with COVID and, um, in general, people are wanting to just know a little bit more about what projects are going on um, and the status of them. So um, not all of the projects um, that we're gonna go through are actually gonna be on the agenda. It's just, we wanted to kind of update the board as well as members of the public, just so they're in the loop. Okay. Um, so the uh, application has been approved by Division of Engineering, Fire Department, um, uh, the water department's going to be sending out a letter um, saying that they're going to refer the application to the Albany County Department of Health, as well as the um, New York State uh, Department of Environmental Conservation for sewer extension. Um, so uh, that's the, the major item that needs to be addressed um, for the water department, and they won't sign off on an application until they get approval from um, Albany County Department of Health and DEC. Um, okay. And uh, we're anticipating receiving comment letters from Division of Traffic and Traffic Safety as well. And again, just as a quick reminder, this is being reviewed by the Historic Resources Commission. Um, so I don't know if there's any other. HRC, okay. um, HRC just saw this and um, they were interested in, in sort of doing something like a like a concept approval. Um, I'm not sure that you know there's a procedure for that necessarily, but I did recommend to them that they could um, submit comments or some type of letter to the planning board in terms of seeker and the impacts on 
um, historic resources in that manner. Yeah, so um, just for the, the board's sake, I did um, send the disposition for that meeting, um, which is basically their meeting minutes, which included the um, um, kind of um, uh, expression of support for the project in general, since there isn't really a formal concept approval. Um, mm -hmm. So they had a number of changes, right? Design changes that they wanted to see but I guess they were, weren't significant enough to, uh, to slow it down. Um, the previous renderings, the height of the building um, wasn't in line with um, the height of neighboring buildings, um, but the applicant has clarified that. So the height um, is appropriate for the okay. site. Um, so in historic districts and um, with a lot of new construction, just making sure that it's contextual where, um, right. you know, the height of the building is not, um, making sure that it's not the highest building on, or the tallest building on the block. Um, right. So. Okay. okay. Has everyone seen the most recent rendering? I think so. Do you have it there? It couldn't hurt to take a look at it. The one, the one that was included with the email, right? Uh, it should have been. Yes, it, it, def it definitely was. It definitely looks more contextual. I don't, I don't know what was going on with the prior rendering but it made the building appear uh, significantly taller than the buildings on either side. And that wasn't okay. in fact the case. Um, I, I also, um, I see that Dan Hirschberg's on. I'm probably gonna follow up with him for a phone call. I do wanna stress the importance when we send this over to the county, um, you know, for the sewer extension that uh, I think we are otherwise ready to act and that this project is contingent upon uh, a grant funding deadline that I believe uh, is coming up rather rapidly. So okay. uh, I, obviously they can only do what they can do. They have to you know, follow the rules, but I just wanted to stress that on this project. I think it's a project that's been well received. And again, it, it may be less competitive for, for funding if it doesn't have the approvals that it needs. To okay, and we expect everything else to be in place. It's just that, that one piece. Sounds yeah. like it. Yeah. And unfortunately, it, it's kind of, you know, they go through their whole review and then when they're comfortable with it, they right. send it over, which, you know. Right. Okay. And, and just to clarify the, for the board too, um, there were issues for the Department of Health and DEC reviewing it due to COVID. So just not being able to access um, computers or equipment to be able to fully review it. So that's why we were seeing a lot of delays as a result for projects that um, needed to be referred to them. Um, my um, understanding from our water department is that the um, that's not going to be the case going forward because they have the capabilities to be more easily reviewing these applications. So I don't think it's going to take as long to review going forward. Okay, very good. Anything else? Any other uh, comments or questions? Okay, sounds like we can get Al back in. Yep. Alrighty. Page two. Okay, 11 Anderson Drive. This uh, project is the one where we um, have also seen where they had removed uh, trees and vegetation to make way for a uh, outdoor vehicle uh, storage area. Um, at the last board meeting, I believe we um, declared ourselves a lead agency, but beyond that, I don't think we uh, actually approved it yet. This is Able or Able Realty. Um, I, I don't think the, the board declared lead agency because I don't think there are any other um, involved agencies where you may be thinking of 25 Delaware Avenue. 
Yeah, I don't know. I I, I didn't have my notes from the last, last meeting, so. No worries. Um, so just as a quick update, um, the application has been reviewed by all city departments and the applicants responding to comments um, from the water department, um, the division of engineering and traffic and traffic safety also provided minor comments. So. Is this uh, any, um, so our, our action would be, um, the recommendation would be uh, probably to approve this now? Um, if the applicant's able to respond to all um, of the water department's comments, so. I think it'll be dependent on that. Yeah, I'd, I'd encourage the applicant to have uh, their engineer, Nick Costa, get in touch with uh, probably Neil O'Connor, the water department, as soon as possible to discuss and work through any of those issues that are outstanding. Since this is a major development plan review, I'm assuming that we, that, that probably we cannot do this uh, as a consent agenda item. Is that right? Um, we're going to be sending a uh, notice uh, to the town of Colony, just letting um, residents there know uh, that um, there will be a meeting and that there's an opportunity for members of the public to comment. Um, this is a comment that's been um, frequently passed um, to us by the Albany County Planning Board um, through recommendations. So just wanting to kind of be a good uh, neighbor to Colony and make sure that um, we give uh, nearby residents the opportunity to comment since it is um, within 500 feet um, of the municipal boundary. I think we may need to give the town time to, well, it's within 500 feet, yeah. I mean, I don't know what, we should just make sure that there's a statutory time frame that we need to give them to review and give us any comments. There may be, um, I don't know what that is off the top of my head. I'll, I'll see if I can look up here. So the, the last time that this happened, this was for um, the proposed demolition for Academy of Holy Names. Um, and the recommendation was just that we send notice to the city clerk um, for the town of Bethlehem in that case. So um, the, my plan the, is this week just to send notice of the meeting to the town clerk for a colony. Yeah, Zach, it's section 239-NN of the general municipal law. Just make sure you double check that. It requires us to notify the adjacent municipality and there's some additional details. Yeah, that's for public hearings, not for public meetings. I would just double check that again. Okay. Any other questions on this one? Okay, let's move on then to 244 State Street. And this also is a major development plan review. And uh, we've seen this one in concept form. Um, which is the conversion of an office building into 61 apartments. Yep, so this is an application that will not be appearing at the meeting. Um, the applicant uh, just submitted um, responses to department comments. Um, and they actually responded uh, very recently to um, the water department's comments. So we're not gonna get those in time for the meeting. Um, and there are some issues um, and just some coordination for the applicant and um, uh, the Center Square Neighborhood Association, just so they can have a dialogue with each other, discuss any um, of the potential impacts of the project. Um, so uh, this is more just providing an update to the board. Um, so this is just currently under review. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would mention the board, I've, I've um walk the site in the the general neighborhood there and and, and i would encourage um each of you to do the same uh, it's just very interesting the state street side is a very different kind of um environment than the chestnut street side of the property uh the state street side um 
it has other office buildings and larger apartment buildings on it. Um, and the, uh, and of course it faces the Smith building. The um, Chestnut Street side is definitely much more residential, uh, smaller scale with the old Victorian townhouses. And, and after reviewing, uh, you know, the, the notes of the meeting and, and the comments that were sent to us uh, and looking myself at those differences, um, I'm, I'm personally right now, at least, um, a little bit more sensitive to the potential that maybe uh, there, this, this proposal may be a little bit on the dense side. But I think that, um, you know, we all ought to take a look at it uh, in person. Okay. Can 60 we, Colvin Avenue. Can we just clarify as we're going through these, whether they are in fact gonna be on the agenda? Uh, if they are on the agenda and we're not planning on taking action, I just ask that we add a for discussion purposes only uh, indicator, just so that people in the public are aware of whether or not to expect action on something. Yep. Um, so the, the next application, 60 Colvin Avenue, this is another one where this will not be on the meeting agenda for this month. Um, and similarly, um, this has been referred to all departments. We're still waiting on comments from the Division of Traffic and Traffic Safety. Once we get all comments, a consolidated comment letter will be sent to the applicant. And I think Amy had some um, uh, discussion topics she had. I don't know if this is, if you wanted to jump in now, Amy, with that. Sure. Um, I wanted to mention to the board that uh, Mike O'Brien has submitted a, a resolution that's related to this site. Um, it's 62.71.20R, um, and I can send that to you after the meeting. Um, the resolution, it relates to the fact that this property is classified as a potential brownfield site in an appendix to the comprehensive plan. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure what the goal of this resolution is or how it's supposed to function necessarily. Um, but, you know, the, the resolution has been referred to the Planning and Economic Development Committee. Brad and I will be attending that committee later this week to talk to them about it. Um, but, you know, as far as, far as the Brownfields issue, um, the comprehensive plan itself states that um, brownfields are defined as vacant or abandoned property that burdens the community is blighted, underdeveloped, and economically disadvantaged. Um, it also says pretty clearly um, the goal of the comprehensive plan is to, um, to return these dormant and underutilized sites back to productive use. So. Those are my comments about the brownfield designation, I suppose. Um, I did also get copies of several um, environmental reports that have been done on the adjacent site, the Westland Hills Park site. Um, that's what Al was talking about earlier. Um, if any of you are interested in those, I'm happy to share those with you. Yeah, the uh, so some of the documentation that was sent by Amy, um, I mean, one clearly shows that the, there is no brownfield on the site itself. Uh, that's the map that I, I looked at. And there was uh, a very comprehensive report done by, I believe it was Clough Harbor at the time. I'm not sure I remember. See, uh, where they were evaluating all sites for a potential public school. And um, there was no indication in that one of any major uh, problems with pollution. And again, they were talking about the site 
that would have been chosen by the middle school, which is not the site that we are looking at concerning 60 Colvin Avenue. It's the site above that, uh, above meaning west of there. They also did a comprehensive evaluation of Westland Hills Park as uh, an, envir an environmental analysis of Western Hill Park, Western, uh, Western Hills Park, and they did find some contamination around the tennis courts. Now, I didn't read every single paragraph of these very comprehensive reports. I'll leave that up to Roman, who's the expert in that. <laughs> but from what I could see, um, I, I didn't see anything that really negates the possibility um, of, a, of some kind of development occurring here, whether it's the current one or one in the future. Uh, so I, I'm at a loss to know why, why we're still dealing with this uh, as a potential pollution site, particularly since the comprehensive plan uh, defined uh, a brownfield site, as Amy just said. Um, so, I, I would also mention that, um, you know, the, the site that does have the contamination um, is it's still classified by DEC. It's currently classified as um, class N and DEC is very careful in their description of class N sites to indicate that they're not necessarily um, a danger to the public. And it's, it's difficult to, um, you know, to draw any conclusions based on that classification. When the city when the city decided not to continue with the brownfields remediation at the adjacent site, DEC would have evaluated the project and were it, um, were it a, an actual threat to the public, it would have classified it differently. Okay. Uh, I, I'd like to put my two cents in if I, if I can. I do, I like to do that sometimes. So appreciate you all giving me the time now, if that's all right. Um, well, the, re the research you did um, is, can be more than two cents. You're welcome. Make it four cents. <laughs> well, I didn't. I didn't def come to as definitive uh, a conclusion. Um, you know, I think the the prior reports were mostly related, at least. And again, I I reviewed these. Uh, you know, I'd say a couple of months back. I'm more familiar with the more recent study. But they were uh, they were related to the adjacent site. I don't know that they tested significantly on 60 Colvin. Um, you know, and there was lead found at that adjacent site. Um, I do agree that the goal of the, the Brownfield program is to uh, eliminate the the contaminants or, and or the perception of contaminants in the goal of finding an, a higher and better use of the site. But I think the only study that was really timely and really got at the site in question is the one that we more recently received uh, from uh, Bill Hennessy. Um, and I think, you know, what I'm looking to do is work with our, our state partners to ensure that what's in that report is adequate, that there were adequate tests done, they went to adequate depths, uh, and that they appropriately applied the criteria that um, those state agencies would, would apply. Um, if that report checks out, you know, I do think the board should accept that report, uh, regardless of the fact that the Hennessy um, group was, in fact, you know, um, is, is working for the applicant in this capacity. They're still putting their professional stamp on a report. And if that report is sufficient, I'm hesitant to go back and ask the applicant to hire another engineer to do the same uh, report, uh, simply due to the lack of confidence in that report, if that report is in fact, you know, uh, not leaving us with a lack of confidence. So I think that's where I sort of diverge with the resolution. Um, you know, maybe in the future, that's something to look at in terms of whether, you know, we should be hiring the individuals doing these, these uh, studies as opposed to the applicant. But there's a lot of practicalities that go with the city hiring people versus a private entity hiring as well. Um, and I don't know that we otherwise have any, any funding to, to go out and, and test the site. So we are reliant upon the, um, the applicant cutting the check in the case of these, these particular projects. So uh, I will be going to the council meeting on, on Thursday night. Uh, I hope to learn more about what Councilman O'Brien uh, is, is looking for. And um, you know, I'll, I'll be in touch with you all as to where this goes. Um, but again, I think there's, there's a number of, um, 
uh, comments that we have on the project with respect to the site plan, uh, technical comments that we need to work through as well. So again, regardless of this issue, I don't think the project would be in a position to, to seek approval at this moment. Okay. Any other comments on 60 Coleman? All right. Um, Zach, you wanted to also discuss with the board um, the bike and pedestrian project. Is that all right? You need to unmute yourself. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave that to the board on how long a presentation um, they would like. Um, my plan was just to uh, go through the briefing that I provided for the Common Council um, recently. It's about a 15 minute presentation and then just leave time at the end for any questions, comments, um, any thoughts that we should be including um, in the project going forward. That works for all the board members. Okay. Yes, it does. Okay. Give me just. Sound one. good to you, everybody. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to switch presentations. So just bear with me for one sec. While you're doing that, uh, Brad, can I ask you? Uh, uh, Another project related question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any have you heard anything from the Stewart's Corporation concerning their proposal at Colvin and Washington? Have you heard anything more since our last meeting? I, I haven't heard anything. I, I thought about that today because um, uh, Tyler from Stewart's reached out on a separate property that they have a sign question regarding. Um, but I can follow up on, on with him on both those items tomorrow. Okay, thanks. You all set? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you all know me usually for uh, working on the planning board, reviewing development projects, but um, since uh, this January. Um, I've also been acting as the project manager on the city's end for the bicycle and pedestrian master plan. Um, the consultants working on this um, uh, are the lead, um, Nelson Nygaard, um, Behan Planning, who's um, doing the outreach for the plan, and then Creighton Manning, who's working on the technical components of the plan. Um, so just a quick run through um, for the discussion. Um, I'll go over the um, overview of the project, the vision and goals for the plan, a quick look at the project website and its features, the results that we got from the neighborhood engagement events, um, upcoming events for the plan, and then provide some time again for questions. Um, so the, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Master Plan was made possible in part by funding from the Capital District Transportation Committee, which is also known as CDTC. CDTC is the Capital District's um, Transportation Metropolitan Planning Organization. Um, and they fund infrastructure projects, provide technical assistance and fund planning projects such as this. So the city received a grant for $67,500 through CDTC's 2020 Community and Transportation Linkage Planning Program to update the city's 2009 bicycle master plan over the course of 2020. The purpose of the update was to review and make any necessary updates to the existing 2009 bicycle master plan, create a new pedestrian master plan, prioritize the needs of pedestrians and cyclists who experience transportation disadvantages. And so examples of people who experience transportation disadvantages include um, people who walk or cycle as their primary mode of transportation, um, community members of color, lower wage earners, people who live in a house without a personal vehicle, people with one or more disabilities, people under 16 or over 65, 
and people whose primary language is not English. And then the final purpose was to provide a clear direction on the locations for future pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure and policies that promote and support walking and cycling in the city. So now I'm gonna quickly walk through the vision and goals, and then the objectives that were created for the plan by the project advisory committee members who are composed of citizen leaders and experts who are regular cyclists and pedestrians. So based on the committee's feedback, the planning vision um, was that more of Albany is served by walking and cycling networks that are welcoming, intuitive, and continuous. Walking, biking, and transit are fundamental and viable transportation options that support a sustainable future. Albany streets feel safe and comfortable for all people who use them. And a culture of awareness and compassion supports all road users as they share the road. So through the implementation of the vision of the plan, the projected goals are that walking and cycling are elevated as viable transportation options and can create resiliency in Albany's transportation network. Policymakers, law enforcement officials, and roadway designers take responsibility for including walking and cycling as part of the transportation system. People using the streets in Albany possessed a shared awareness and responsibility for street safety. Community members understand and benefit from incorporating walking and cycling in their daily lives, and that the plan is used to inform funding programs. So to achieve the vision and goals of the project, the plan will include the following objectives. Um, identifying a connected and continuous low traffic stress bicycle network that connects key destinations and is accessible to all Albany residents and visitors. Similarly, also identify a priority pedestrian network that connects residents with places they work, live, and play. Prioritizing walking and cycling access to transit, since many transit riders walk and cycle as part of their commute or their trips. Support excellent places to walk and cycle for recreation. Provide information campaigns that increase awareness on and promote walking and cycling as a component of an active and sustainable lifestyle. Reduce congestion and vehicle miles traveled by providing inviting walking and cycling facilities. Develop and fund cost-effective phased projects while prioritizing uh, populations that'll benefit uh, most from these projects. And then also develop active transportation guidelines. Um, so before I get into the results for the initial um, project outreach, I just wanted to quickly share the website um, the project survey and the wiki map. Here's a screenshot of the homepage for the project website and the website link is listed below. At the top of the homepage, you can view the vision and goals of the project that I just went over. You can view the timeline for the plan, access um, the links for the wiki map and survey that I'll discuss on the next slide, um, find upcoming project events and access meeting recordings for the six neighborhood meetings um, that took place in June. And then use the comment box to send our project team questions and comments on the plan. So here are the screenshots for the project survey and the wiki map. The wiki map's been really exciting because we've had um, more than 423 people who have provided comments um, on cycling, walking, signage, and safety issues in the city, um, as well as add to other people's comments. Um, because of the large number of comments, um, just as a warning, uh, the website um, may take a little time to load. Um, so just be patient with it and it will work. Um, additionally, if you scroll, it might take a little bit of time to refresh as well. Um, the survey and the wiki map along with the project website are gonna be available throughout um, the end of the year. And these items will inform the policy recommendations and proposed projects in the plan. Um, and if, any of the board members um, want to see a demonstration um, at the end of the meeting, I'm happy to do that as well. It's, it's actually a, a lot of fun to use. I've gone in there a couple of times. Yeah, it's, it's great to see people's it's comments and how they interact with one another. Yes, good point. Um, so our project team began um, the engagement process in May and then throughout June by holding six neighborhood meetings, um, a meeting for bicycle users as well. And then um, 
other informational meetings um, through focus groups and kind of presentations like this um, that have reached over 135 people. So in place of an in-person meeting, um, our project consultants began planning, developed an introductory YouTube video to acquaint um, residents with the goals and timeline for the plan, um, website, survey, and wiki map, kind of like what I just did. In June, there were seven meetings held on Zoom to discuss current cycling and walking issues and future policies and infrastructure projects that can improve cycling and walking in the city. Um, the list on the screen includes the relevant neighborhoods and neighborhood associations that were included in each of the six neighborhood meetings. Um, and the next slide will show how those meeting numbers cord, uh, correspond with the cluster of neighborhoods. Um, and just as a point of clarification, um, while these were geared towards certain neighborhoods, um, attendees could come from any neighborhood um, and also um, attendees, even if they were from those neighborhoods, um, did make comments outside of their neighborhoods. So this is a map kind of showing the clusters. Um, I'm going to walk through some of the major themes from each of these meetings. Um, please let me know if you want me to go back to this map while I'm talking um, about any of the findings. So from the bicycle user group meeting, um, some of the themes that were discussed included the difficulty in cycling on streets with steep inclines and no bicycle facilities, um, uh, particularly bike lanes, um, and how that makes it difficult getting from the eastern to the western portions of the city. Um, road conditions, including potholes and cobblestones, made it difficult to cycle on streets that could be useful to a larger bicycle network and that more information and signage could um, better acquaint new cyclists um, to existing routes and inform motorists about um, how they're always required to share the road. So for neighborhood meeting one, um, that included the center square, downtown, Hudson and Park, Lincoln Park, Mansion, Park South, Pastures, Washington Park, and Washington Square neighborhoods. Some of the comments from this meeting included um, a need for more north-south bicycle routes in residential neighborhoods. Participants liked um, some of the existing north-south routes, um, excuse me, north-south routes, uh, including the new South End Connector, but they wanted to increase the number of routes internal to the city. Um, uh, participants also wanted to see connections between Madison Avenue and the Hackett Boulevard multi-use path via Lark Street to improve connections to Lincoln Park and University Heights. Um, some of the participants wanted to see uh, some of the traffic lights converted to stop signs, um, since they felt that people respect stop lights uh, more than they do a yellow uh, light. And uh, connections to major destinations, such as the Empire State Plaza and Washington Park, um, are often not safe due to poor visibility, fast speeds, and a lack of signage. So for neighborhood meeting two, that included the Delaware Avenue, Lincoln Park, Mount Hope, uh, Second Avenue, and South End neighborhoods. Some of the comments from this meeting um, included that uh, while South Pearl Street serves as a major route for residents who don't have access to cars, the condition of the road and lack of bicycle facilities make it a difficult route. Formalizing the use of existing paths in University Heights um, could improve the visibility of existing networks. Increasing the number of barns dance intersections to make wider roads easier and safer to cross. And so for anyone who doesn't know, a barns dance um, signal allows pedestrians and cyclists on every corner to cross at the same time, um, which therefore leads um, to people being able to cross diagonally and making the short uh, the crossing time shorter. And yeah, they fine. have that. They have that, I think, at the Smith Building on Washington Avenue. Yep. Uh, yeah. The Washington. problem is. The problem is that they don't have it. They have it. Uh, I don't think they always have it signalized. So that on Saturdays and Sundays, you have to wait forever when there's no pedestrians there. Yeah, sometimes those uh, take nuance, and sometimes it's making it um, a barn stance intersection at some points in the day, and and other points of the day it not being. Um, and then finally, um, uh, participants wanted to. Uh, see our department investigate opportunities to build from previous pedestrian safety improvements along Delaware Avenue. 
um, such as lowering speeds and providing more clear signage to improve driver awareness, um, while also exploring parallel bicycle routes since Delaware Avenue is fairly narrow. So for neighborhood meeting three, this included the Beverwick, Helderberg, um, the areas covered by the New Albany um, Neighborhood Association, New Scotland and Woodlawn, Normanskill, Pine Hills, and Whitehall. Some of the comments from this meeting um, included uh, a, a desire for installing pedestrian um, and cyclist infrastructure on paper streets to provide more connections between neighborhoods. Uh, continuing the Hackett Boulevard multi-use path from Sycamore Street to South Manning Boulevard. Increasing the number of crosswalks along Manning Boulevard and Washington Avenue extension. And improving maintenance along the shoulder of roads to improve usability um, for cyclists, even if there's not a formalized bike lane. So for neighborhood meeting four, this included the Buckingham Lake campus area um, for U Albany's Uptown Campus, Eagle Hill, Manning Boulevard, Melrose, the Pine Bush Neighborhood Association, and Upper Washington Avenue Neighborhood Association. So some of the comments from this meeting included um, bicycle and pedestrian improvements along Berkshire Boulevard would provide a low stress east-west route and provide greater access to Buckingham Pond. Um, improving pedestrian connectivity between schools and neighborhoods would help um, kids be able to walk to school safely. Um, traffic calming improvements, additional sidewalks and bicycle lanes on streets such as Breviter Street and Manning Boulevard would improve connections between Washington and Western Avenue. And uh, prioritizing pedestrian and cycling improvements on streets such as Rapp Road and Fuller Road to improve intermunicipal connections with Colony and Gilderland. Um, neighborhood meeting five included the Arbor Hill, Sheridan Hollow, Tembrook Triangle, West End, and West Hill neighborhoods. Some of the comments from this meeting, um, kind of building from that last comment, uh, was continuing uh, the Manans bicycle lane on Broadway to provide an easier connection between Albany and Manans. Um, adding stop signs on hills, such as Clinton Avenue, to prevent cars from speeding. Um, and, this would allow cyclists to feel a little bit more comfortable using existing bicycle facilities. Um, continuing the Clinton Avenue bicycle lanes down to Broadway. Um, this is brought up in the DRI plan um, as well. Um, addressing exposed tree roots um, since they um, reduce the accessibility of sidewalks for pedestrians of all abilities. And um, connecting uh, the bicycle lanes on Tenbroke Street um, and Northern Boulevard either through um, Manning Boulevard or Lark Drive. So neighborhood meeting six, this included North Albany, Shaker Park and Bishop's Gate um, neighborhoods. Some of the comments from this meeting included um, a desire to improve the pedestrian experience along long blocks by providing facilities such as trash cans, mid block to prevent littering um, and identifying ways to make the focus of walking less on getting from point A to point B adding interpretive signage in the warehouse district um, on the history of Albany to encourage walking tours and pub tours. This is also something that's brought up in the DRI plan as well, um, as well as the next comment for um, adding lighting under the Livingston Avenue bridge to encourage um, warehouse district and downtown connections, adding a bicycle lane on Loudonville Road, and finally encouraging more amenities along the Albany County Rail Trail, Corning Preserve, and Mohawk Hudson bike hike trail. Um, and one of the exciting things was Albany County is saying that they're looking into allowing um, uh, vendors um, to park at the trailhead. So we are starting to see a move towards this as well, um, which is exciting. So building from the community meetings in June, um, we're continuing to schedule and meet with community groups and organizations. Um, throughout the month of July and throughout the project. So if any of you work with an organization that you think would benefit from a focus group, feel free to reach out to our department at dpd at albanyny.gov or feel free to reach out to me directly um, and we'd be happy to set up a meeting. Um, so looking at the schedule moving into August and September, we're gonna take the information that we've um, 
received from the community meetings, focus groups, survey results, and Wikimap comments um, to implement two demonstration projects to test some of the ideas that have been proposed. Uh, in September and October, um, a draft plan will be created. And in mid-October to early November, um, we'll hold a public workshop, which will allow members of the public to comment on the draft plan. Um, and this will also give um, our project team time to make any final adjustments based on those comments before submitting um, the final plan in December of this year. So with that, um, happy to answer any questions um, that the board has and hear your feedback. Um, any comments about uh, upcoming infrastructure projects or maybe policies that we can look into as well, especially since you all work with the zoning code um, on a frequent basis like our department does. Nope, um, very interesting. Is the wiki going to stay open uh, through uh, through most of the project? Yep, it's so the, the project's going through um, January to December. So it, it'll be at least throughout um, the year. We might run over a little bit into January of next year. Um, but the, the website's um, going to be available throughout the year. Um, and just to take a step back too, I just want to um, say uh, Martin was able to work on the original plan um, and it's given us a really good backbone to work from um, when updating this plan. Um, so again, Martin, you're gonna have a lot of experience having looked at this, you know, 10 years ago as well. So um, yes. I'm happy to be hearing from you and get your feedback and comments as well. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to see what, uh, you know, what, uh, what will have changed, what people's uh, priorities have changed. And, what's changed in, in the city to really, I think is pushing us to demand more uh, bicycle, uh, bicycle transportation. We see a lot of people out there now. Was there a um, analysis uh, in the plan about the uh, ownership of cars and how many households in the city own cars versus how many do not? Uh, it seems like that would be especially looking for future funding for some of these infrastructure projects would be a major convincing point uh, in attempting to get funds. Yeah, so our, our consultants, um, as part of um, drafting the plan, um, they're going to be looking at census data and um, data that's available through um, CDTC and the Department of Transportation, as well as um, data that we have internal to the city. Um, to guide where future infrastructure projects are going to take place um, and future policies that make sense going forward. So yeah, I mean, census data is going to be important um, as a justification. And um, as you mentioned, this plan is going to be a document that's going to be very helpful for us um, when uh, looking at the consolidated funding announcement through the state to receive funds um, or through um, other public and private funding sources and grants. One of the things that, uh, in, a in terms of a demonstration project, um, I would recommend, and I guess this might be partly because of my own interest, but um, you know, a lot of people have talked about New Scotland Avenue being an excellent place uh, because the uh, the street is wide enough it's not wide enough for two lanes of traffic and it ends up with being a lane and a half, which helps for bicyclists. But having said that, we have this delightful little connector just below New Scotland Avenue called Helderberg. And it runs from Academy Road all the way to uh, Weiss Road next to St. Peter's Hospital. And um, there are a couple of places where one cannot drive, but you one can bicycle. Uh, and with some improvements, very minor costs, that you could make that an alternate and a very quiet alternate to um, a potential New Scotland, you know, major bicycle route. Um, the kids in our neighborhood are lucky because um, they could, they, you know, they could ride their bikes uh, pretty much unsupervised 
for most of that distance because it's very quiet and there's very few cars that even though there are you know there are street connectors um the most improved part of that route happens to be in in the blocks where i live but then after that it becomes a little funky in spots and places where you know the cars can't make a connection between one street and another but bicycles certainly can so i'm just putting a pitch in for that <laughs> cuz yeah. i think it's cheap it's a cheap uh, it's a cheap way to to do a demonstration yeah, this is something that we've heard from, you know, our advisory committee members, as well as members of the public that there's an interest in. Um, not only that it's a good um, example of a potential bicycle boulevard um, with some um, off-road connections like you were mentioning. Um, there are some sections um, where you said it's um, cars can't get through where there are significant uh, grade changes. So um, that's something that I'll um, likely be addressed, um, but it's a really good opportunity to connect um, hospitals yeah. as well. So, right, there's only two great changes, really. One, one on uh, from uh, halfway through from Ramsey down to Pinewood, and then uh, it flattens out. And then there's another great change right. uh, that go that goes up from um, uh, Sycamore to Cardinal. Uh, you better sign up to be an ambassador if we do that demonstration project. Sure. <laughs> maybe Mart Martin, you could, maybe you too. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Do they make a Do they make a bicycle tall enough for Martin? <laughs> oh yeah, you got a special order of them now. Yeah, it takes a long time. Wow. eBay, get these e-bikes. Everybody's probably gonna have them customized and <laughs> the real deal. <laughs> I actually have a little Brompton uh, folding bike. So, Chris, I think Roman, one of the major, the major smallest problems, bikes you know, we, the major problem we face though still, I mean, from the bicycle point of view is the roads. Um, they are rough. Um, and it, I think it drives a lot of bicycles, uh, bicyclists to ride on, on the um, sidewalks. Uh, yeah, I think point. probably bicycles will tell you that number one, they want to ride on the sidewalk because they don't feel safe on the road. And number, then number two, because the road has too many, you know, just bumps and grinds. I mean, when I, when I bicycle and most of the time I do it in the early morning, when I go to the co-op, um, the, the roads are empty and I'm weaving all, in, in and out of, all over the place to avoid the bumps. Because yeah. if, you hit one, if you hit one wrong, you know, you could bend your, destroy your tire and bend your rim. Right. Yeah, I mean, th this is a big issue um, that we've heard from uh, participants, um, you know, and there, uh, some people have said, you know, off-road connections would be great. Um, you know, and there's some areas where there's an existing sidewalk where there um, might be enough room in the right of way to expand it and make it a multi-use path. Um, so it, it does kind of match the natural inclinations of cyclists. Um, some cyclists also noted that, you know, sometimes sidewalks um, don't get as quick of maintenance um, as the street does. So um, but some people prefer um, still being on the road just because they know it'll more likely be plowed. So um, yeah. this will be a good opportunity to figure out, you know, where each of those types of treatments makes the most sense. Yeah, I mean the problem is money, though. I mean, you know, we live we live in a, a northern climate, and uh, it's pretty hard to avoid the kinds of uh, pothole issues and cracks and and everything that we face here. So, you know, I don't think we'll ever be able to solve that problem a hundred percent. Yeah, and some of that will be us um, working with city departments to just to create. Um, policies that do improve that experience. So, you know, potholes are going to happen, you know, maintenance issues are going to happen, but um, finding a way that makes sure that improvements, you know, really serve the people that, um, you know, don't have an option um, to be able to use a car and are dependent on walking or cycling. So um, trying to align that with the mayor's um, equity agenda as well. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? 
Anybody I, have, I would, have any other comments? I, I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to see a lot of uh, office conversions in our future. Office to residential conversions. I'm just getting curious the um, way yes. it sounds like office is on the way somewhere else. So. I mean, I, I, that, that could be a good thing or, you know, could totally overwhelm us. It's something to maybe be thinking about going forward. Mm -hmm. It's what the reports and data are suggesting that your punch is the direction. Could yeah, be. Brad, just from, just from uh, the information that I've seen, um, that's one of the thoughts going around and it's actually on, on a national basis. You know, what's actually gonna happen with that? What's gonna happen with retail? Uh, once this is all said and done, you know, you're going to have a you know, paradigm shift in, in your real estate and uses. The question is how it's, what it's going to be and what direction it's going to take. Um, I guess we won't know till we, we see it end. Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing that somewhat with 244 State Street where they do have, you know, residential units, but they also have the um, co-working space as well. So it might just yeah. be a different right. ratio in buildings going forward. Well, with, with, like I said, I've, I've always said this in the past, historically, uh, Albany, like the CBD, your office space, it's not that new tenants are moving in, it's just tenants, existing tenants are moving around. They're mm -hmm. going from 244 state to, you know, 90 state or whatever, vice versa kind of thing. Um, you know, other than what, 6-7 prime, 6 seven, seven prime, which is new construction quite a few years ago now, you know, but they just, all their tenants for the most part came from uh, 54 state and 66 South Pearl. So, um, you know, there's only so much demand for office space, but things change. You know, you are seeing uh, an increase in folks living downtown. So uh, maybe with more conversions, you'll see more demand for the office space. Maybe the cost for housing will finally start to go down. Maybe. <laughs> Well, everybody wants to build luxury housing. Nobody wants to build you know, reasonable housing because that's you get more bang for your buck. You know, you same sheetrock you build for one structure, but if you put a granite countertop and then and in one, you can call it a luxury apartment and, and get more rent. It's you know? it all starts as luxury too, and then twenty years later, it's moderate market, you know, and so on and so forth. So it's yeah. a natural yeah. sort of progression. So. Well, I mean, if there was any you know one goal I would like to see is. And I think we're seeing it more with these these developments. As uh, so you have this co-working space, you have people more uh, working more from home. The uh, different uh, changes in in how people work and what they work on. But um, I think that we we got to continually push for uh, affordable housing, workforce housing, housing that you know people can afford because. Uh, and I think sometimes the development of the more high-end apartments like on Ontario Street uh, it helps get people out of uh, lower cost housing than, than other people can occupy who have been stuck in pretty bad housing. So, I mean, that's probably maybe a, a plus, you know, if that happens uh, more and more. Mm -hmm. So anything else? I think that's good. That's all I got. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks, if not before. Yeah. Okay. Sounds okay. good. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good evening. Take care.